Hello, it's Matt again. Welcome back for our country number two, Andorra. I'm releasing the first two in two weeks because I was already a bit ahead of schedule on those, but usually these things will come out about once every two weeks if I can stay on schedule. This week's episode will be on Charlemagne and how he helped found Andorra. Charlemagne did about a billion things and is responsible in many ways for Europe as we know it. So this 20-minute episode is not really going to cover more than just a brief background in his interactions with Andorra. If you want some more information on Charlemagne, there are many books and podcasts, and there's even a metal album done by none other than 90-year-old Christopher Lee, who, if you don't know by name, is Count Dooku or Soromon from the Lord of the Rings movies, but is also an ancestor of Charlemagne. I read the Carolingian Chronicles, as far as book goes, books go, but there are lots of other books that are available. Uh, as for part podcasts, that's what I'm going to be doing with this many episodes. So here we go. The History of English podcast has six episodes where Charlemagne plays a big part, and each episode is about an hour long. The one that we're going to look at focuses on Charlemagne's reign, and especially reform-related things. And, of course, it's the history of English, so it looks at how Charlemagne's things influenced English words. It was pretty interesting to find some common words from Charlemagne in English. It's also pretty interesting. Uh, I enjoy this podcast. I've been a Patreon supporter for a while of it. It's very well researched, and uh, you can learn lots of things about words in the English language that you never knew where they came from. Here's our sample of that one. And with respect to Offa's coins, we once again find a connection between the events in the Frankish kingdom and events in Britain. During this period, Charlemagne reformed the official coinage in the Frankish kingdom. He decided to tie everything to a pound of silver, or livre of silver in French. A pound of silver was divided into 20 equal parts to create a solidus. And a solidus was divided into 12 equal parts to create a denier. And that became the standard French currency. The plural form of solidus is solidi. And solidi were used as standard currency for paying mercenaries and other fighters. And in French, a fighter who was paid with solidi became known as a soldier or soldier today. Now it's important to note that the decimal system was not in use when Charlemagne reformed and standardized the Frankish currency. So, they didn't use the modern increments of 10 that we use today. It took 12 deniers to make a solidus, and 20 solidi to make a pound, or livre of silver. So, by that math, it took 240 deniers to equal a pound of silver. So, the math was a little more complicated. But the Anglo-Saxons apparently decided that Charlemagne had the right idea, because Offa's coins were soon reformed to copy the new Frankish system. Offa's penny was the equivalent of the French denier. The English shilling was the equivalent of the French solidus. And the English pound was a direct translation of the French livre. Another one is the Viking Age podcast. It has a five-episode series on the Franks and their wars with the Saxons. Each episode is about an hour long as well. And this show is very well thought out, has some good information in general about the Carolingians, but then also about how they affected the lands around them. This show is obviously focused on the Viking Age, so we're going to talk a lot about the Vikings in it, but uh, these series are mostly focused on the Saxon Wars with Charlemagne. So uh, go have a listen. This event would have likely been every bit as shocking to the pagan psyche as the sacking of Lindisfarne in Iona was to the Christian. This dramatic event was just an indication of things to come. And as we will see, the whole of the Saxon Wars were as much concerned with religion as they were with Frankish conquest. And that's a theme that we will be returning to frequently throughout this episode. It would take another couple of years for the Saxon Wars to really heat up, however, as Charlemagne was distracted by events in northern Italy. 
In 773, the Pope appealed to Charlemagne for assistance against renewed Lombard aggression. The Franks had of course been allied with the papacy since Pippin the Short was anointed by Pope Stephen two decades earlier. Accordingly, as the winter of 773 approached, Charlemagne gathered together the Frankish armies, marched over the Alps, and laid siege to the Lombard capital at Pavia. After a long, snowy siege, the king of the Lombards surrendered in the spring of 774, yielding to Charlemagne his person, his treasury, and his crown. That's right. In 774 CE, Charlemagne added King of the Lombards to his list of royal titles. This was the first time a European monarch had assumed the royal title of a conquered land in over two centuries. And with this alone, we can start to see why King Charles became known as the Great. Next one is the History of Byzantium podcast. They have one episode that's related to the goings-on between the Byzantine Emperor at the time and Charlemagne. Interesting stuff that may get glossed over, but it's definitely a, an interesting connection between the one who is named Emperor of the Romans and the old Eastern Roman Empire. This podcast is traipsing through the entirety of Byzantine history, so there's lots of interesting stuff here to get latched into. This brings us to Pippin's son, Charles. Charles Magnus, as he was known, Charles the Great. He was given this title to distinguish him from his own son, Charles, but it didn't take long for the name to acquire a new meaning. Charlemagne was a tall, powerful, and charismatic figure who took naturally to life on campaign. He was also ruthless and utterly committed to extending Frankish power by military means. He put down a fresh uprising in Aquitaine in 769, then marched east against the pagan Saxons, sacking their major cult site and carrying much booty home. Charles was not alone yet. He had a brother, Carloman, who he didn't get on with, Fortunately, or perhaps deliberately, Carloman died two years into their joint reign. His children went to live with the Lombards at Pavia, who were once again threatening the Pope's position in Rome. Pope Hadrian sent word to Charlemagne that he was in need of assistance, and Charles was more than happy to kill two birds with one siege. Against the advice of his court, Charlemagne brought a huge army to the gates of Pavia and stayed all winter. The surprised Lombard king, Desiderius, was forced to submit in spring 774, and his line was extinguished. Instead of installing a puppet to rule, Charles decided that he was now king of the Franks and Lombards. His brother's children disappeared at about the same time. The next podcast is called the Medieval World Podcast. It has a whole bunch of episodes on both Charlemagne and the Carolingians. As you know, we talk about they have a big impact on the Middle Ages, if you listen to my podcast. We'll be sampling one episode from the bunch. This podcast is very well researched and informative. Now, in the 780s, Charlemagne began expanding his horizons a bit. Rather than focus solely on war, he started to better his realm through a series of educational reforms. These reforms were initiated by his courtiers, those who were in his entourage. These intellectuals formed a school at Charlemagne's palace, which was not really stationary. Rather, it moved as it had for many of his ancestors from location to location, with the king. Now, chief among these courtiers was a man named Alcuin, who we should probably talk a little bit about. Alcuin was an Anglo-Saxon from the island of Britain. He was very well educated. When he entered Charlemagne's court in around 780 or 782, 
he brought his intellectual pursuits with him. But Alcuin was not alone in Charlemagne's court. Many others from Britain, Italy, Spain, they all flocked to Charlemagne's court. Alcuin and his peers encouraged the king to increase the education in his realm by funding monasteries, where the monks would create schools, and they also encouraged Charlemagne to place learned men to lead these monasteries. Then there's the Founders of Nations podcast, which, of course, is the one I'm doing. It's about a 22-minute episode on Charlemagne, and it tries to cover most of the goings-on between Charlemagne and the Andorans and give some background around that and how it happened. The final podcast we're going to talk about is the We Talk About Dead People podcast. They're one we've used before. They have a two-hour episode that goes into amounts of details, and they cover pretty much every area of what makes Charles so main. This podcast is basically like listening to a rock morning radio show, but about historical events, so be ready for silliness and a steady stream of cursing. But it does seem very well researched, although sometimes a bit uh, against the savages, as they call them often. Uh, there are some other things. The Life of Charlemagne is a book that was written by Einhardt, who is Charlemagne's court historian. That one has been turned into a podcast with five episodes averaging about 15 minutes each. You can find that at loyalbooks.com. Just look up The Life of Charlemagne. You can find the podcast ebook there. And then there's a 20 minute interview on the family of Charlemagne uh, at the Charlemagne Medieval Empire Builder episode on History Extra. So that about wraps it up. Hope to hear you at my episode. But don't worry if you like the others better. You can just skip mine and come back for the list of episodes on the next guy in two weeks.